Good evening. Thanks for tuning into this event, co-sponsored by the Menard Family George Washington Forum at Ohio University. Tonight's event is part of the Menard Family Guest Speakers Program and is co-sponsored by the Fund for American Studies. The Washington Forum has long had an active guest speaker program, but the heart of the GWF has been its undergraduate fellows program. Since 2010, 53 OU undergrads have come through the program and they've all been a singularly outstanding group of students who have or will soon go on to do great things after graduation. One of the most outstanding undergraduate fellows who have come through the program is Emma Zagunk, who will graduate in May with a BA and an MA in four years time. Two summers ago, she interned at the US Department of Health and Human Services, Global Affairs, Middle East and North Africa office. And that internship was sponsored by the Fund for American Studies. And I'd like to introduce Melissa Granatino, who will say something about that DC internship program. Thank you. The Fund for American Studies, or TFAS, hosts Washington DC based and virtual academic internship programs for undergraduate students each summer, fall and spring. TFAS is a nonprofit founded in Washington DC more than 50 years ago with a mission of developing honorable leadership skills in college students and young professionals in the US and around the world. Before we get started, I'd like to show a one minute video about what we do here at TFAS. You say you wanna make an impact, change the world, learn new things, become the leader you were meant to be. It's on your to-do list. You'll cross it off one day. You've always dreamed of living in the big city. How about the world's most important city, Washington, DC? Live steps away from Capitol Hill, the White House, and Supreme Court, places where history is made every day. You want to find your passion and do work that actually matters. Explore different career paths, gain new skills, and add real world work experience to your resume through guaranteed internship placement. You always talk about wanting to grow your network, meet prominent public leaders from all over the world and around the corner, engage in new ideas in the classroom while earning credit from a world-class research university. So what are you waiting for? Turn your to-do list into a do list. Visit dcinternships.org to learn more about TFAS academic internship programs. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, um, uh, Melissa. Um, Shortly after finishing her HHS fellowship, uh, funded by the Fund for American Studies, Emma Zagonk uh, asked if we could invite tonight's speaker to campus. That event would have happened in the spring, but for uh, COVID. Uh, but we're finally uh, able to have Ann Bradley here tonight, and it's a great pleasure. Ann is the George and Sally Meyer Fellow for Economic Education and Academic Director for TFAS. She earned a PhD in economics from Georgetown, from George Mason University, where she's also been a visiting professor. In addition, she's taught at Georgetown, Charles University in Prague, and Grove City College. She's currently an ACT and affiliate scholar and visiting scholar at the Bernard uh, Center for Women, Politics, and Public Policy. And she lectures regularly for Institute for Humane Studies and the Foundation for Economic Education. All of you tonight will have a chance to ask uh, questions of Dr. Bradley. Below, you'll find a Q&A function. Put your questions in there, and after Dr. Bradley finishes speaking, I'll put them to her. Thanks for being here tonight, Anne. Thank you, Professor Ingram, for having me. It is a pleasure. I'm going to just pause for a minute so I can share my screen. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay. Hopefully, can you give me a thumbs up if you see my slides? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Well, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Emma and uh, Professor Ingram, for inviting me and for having me. And thank you for showing up on a Zoom uh, lecture series, which I know is not the same, <clears throat> excuse me, as if we were doing it in person. But nonetheless, technology. Uh, allows us to be together. And so I'm really grateful for that. And I want to talk tonight about a topic that is, I think, increasingly important. Um, I think it's as old as time, uh, but I think it's of increasing political relevance. And that's this idea of income inequality. 
we hear a lot about it. You see here, my title is really intentional, the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> so uh, that's how I want to approach this, um, is really to unpack this idea of income inequality. What does it mean? How do we assess it? How do we measure it? And how do we know, um, you know, when it might be a good thing in society to have unequal incomes, uh, when it might be a bad thing to have unequal incomes, and when it might be a vicious uh, or, or pernicious uh, phenomenon. And so we hear a lot of, of conversations about it, and uh, I want to kind of try to unpack what the critics have to say. So the first thing I'm going to tell you is that it's never as cut and dry or as black and white as we would like to believe these issues to be. So I think that some people would say income inequality is not a big deal, never a problem, don't worry about it, move on, think about other policy considerations. And I think there are some who say income inequality is the worst um, social uh, phenomena that we could see, and so we need to put all of our effort into trying to rectify it. I don't think that either of those positions are accurate. I think that what we really need to do is unpack why it happens and how it happens uh, to really get an understanding of, you know, are there upsides to this and are there downsides to this? But I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about the critics. So who are they? What do they think? Um, there's obviously you could do, um, go ser search the peer reviewed journals and there's just tons and tons of economic literature debating and trying to measure and trying to better understand income inequality. We don't have time for all of that, but I will say that this is not just an issue that you see being battled out in the peer reviewed journals, which is what academics do, but it's also a policy issue and I think it's a cultural issue. And so <clears throat> there are uh, some major viewpoints that have been presented. I'm just showing you a few of them or sharing a few of them with you, but there are certainly more. Um, so what are the what are the critics saying and who are they? So I think the first uh, that I want to talk about is the academic side of this. So this is Thomas Piketty. Um, he's holding his book called Capital uh, in the 21st Century, which, by the way, is about I think it's about 800 pages. It's a tome of data and statistics and empirical analysis on income inequality. I was teaching at TFAST this summer that this came out. And I went to my Amazon cart to buy a copy and you couldn't get any, it was sold out. So I thought, wow, um, this is an 800 page statistical book that is sold out on Amazon. And to me, I think that's very telling of the cultural phenomena that is attached to income inequality. A lot of people care about it and people wanna learn from academics um, and others about how do we think through this. So Piketty has been a very vocal critic of income inequality, in particular in the United States. His view is that income inequality is increasing over the um, 20th century and into the 21st century, and that this causes macroeconomic problems. Uh, the primary macroeconomic problem that he sees is that the accumulation of uh, the benefits that come from um, capital accumulation among the wealthy from their investments are grow faster than the rate of economic growth. And when that happens, income stays in the hands of the wealthy. Um, and so this is a bad thing. And so you would expect, and he projects that income inequality will continue to get worse. So, you know, this really strikes a big chord. Um, and a lot of people start talking, you know, it, I would say it reignites the discussion because I think this discussion is as old as time, the relationship between the rich in society and the poor in society, that's as old as time. But I think this reignites it um, in a very profound way. I think you have American politicians who are very vocal, outspoken critics of inequality. Here, uh, this is just one person who's spoken about it a lot, which is Bernie Sanders. Of course, he was a presidential um, uh, candidate uh, earlier this year. And this is a quote from Sanders. I think it's really important to understand what people are saying so we can understand their point of view. Why are they saying it? What are they after? What do they want? Uh, so he says you don't necessarily need a choice of 23 underarm spray deodorants or of 18 different pairs of sneakers when children are hungry in this country. This is a very important statement that you'd want to unpack a little bit. This is, of course, just one of many statements he's made. I encourage you to go back if you're interested in the critics and read what they say and read what they write. Um, so these are just, again, two examples. Um, and of course, there's, you know, like I said, there's, there's many more who hold these views both academically and in, in policy circles. Uh, and and it, it's a cultural issue as well. 
So what Sanders is saying here is making an important claim about how the US economy functions, which is this, you go into the grocery store and there's a lot of underarm deodorants. There's a lot, there's 23 in his example, right? And then you go onto Amazon or you go to Walmart maybe, and there's 18 different pairs of sneakers that you get to choose from. This is actually an understatement, right? There's way more than 18 different pairs of sneakers that you could choose from, especially if you're thinking about a place like Amazon or Walmart, many more than 18. So he views this as wasteful, right? There's this inventory that's giving rich consumers a lot of choices, like what's really the big difference between a Brooks sneaker and a Nike sneaker? Well, it depends on what you're wearing them for, right? Some of it's just preference, commitment to a brand, maybe you're a runner, maybe you're a lacrosse player, there's all sorts of considerations. But he views this excessive inventory that's sitting on the shelves available to mostly wealthy people, again, in his view, as damaging because it means that there's less available for other people. I would argue that if that's correct, we actually should be worried about that, right? If it's true that lots of choices are only available to wealthy people and that having those choices means there's fewer resources available for other people, I don't want to live in a society like that, right? Unless I'm guaranteed to, be, guaranteed to be at the top of the ladder all the time and I never have to worry about it. Of course, we don't live in that world where you're guaranteed to be on the top. So again, his point is that there's so much stuff. If we just had one deodorant, if we just had one or two, you know, kind of brands of sneakers to choose from, then there would be resources available to feed hungry children. And of course, I, I think where we, we would not agree or where we would agree with Sanders is that we don't want children to be hungry. We don't want poverty to continue to be a persistent problem, but rather we want human flourishing, right? And so this talk is, is garnered, and my work on this is garnered around that assumption. We want human flourishing for everyone. <coughs> Excuse me, human flourishing implies agency. You have agency over your life, that you have choices. So agency is empowered through choice, right? What the definition of being poor is that your choices are very constrained. And so you're forced to, to either depend on other people all the time or to produce everything that you need on your own. And these, of course, are things that embody very high transactions, costs, and trade-offs. So we want to kind of start there with the critics, okay? We want to take their claims and we want to address those claims. And, you know, just to put all my cards out there up front, like I said before, I think sometimes any income inequality is a really uh, vicious phenomenon in societies. And then I think there are times when income inequality is a sign of a robust, productive economy where everybody has a lot of opportunities. And so that's why, you know, it's not as black and white or um, as, you know, kind of cut and dry as we would like it to be. Because if it was cut and dry, it would be easy to make policy analysis and policy decisions around it. The fact that it's nuanced and complicated means we have to be sophisticated in our analysis of these problems. So taking, taking Sanders um, from, I think, his, his right thinking about the poor, right? He wants to help the poor and he wants to help the disenfranchised and the marginalized. I think we all, I hope, I certainly agree with that. So then we have to start asking questions of what kind of society do we live in? So my analysis is largely focused on the US economy, but I think if you're going to do a study of income inequality, you have to do a country by country basis. We cannot talk really about global inequality with, with a lot of depth. So we can look at the data and, and we can see where they're going. But I think if you want to understand income inequality in a place, you're going to have to look at the data for that place. So largely, I'm speaking about the US economy here. And so the question, again, that, that uh, is raised in my mind is, well, how are people earning income? And keep in mind that in this talk, I'm speaking about income inequality, not wealth inequality. Wealth inequality is a bit different, and it's certainly much more difficult to measure. Um, wealth being not just your income stream, but your assets. Um, uh, you know, how happy your assets make you, uh, it's a very tricky thing to try to get data on. So we're looking at income inequality, and that's what most economists are looking at when they're talking, having these conversations. But I think it's important to note that those are different. So here I'm talking about income inequality. And, you know, to me, that Sanders and Piketty's questions raise questions for me, which is, okay, what kind of society do we live in? 
in the US economy? Do we live in a society where income is in fact a zero sum game? If you're an econ major, you know that language, or if you've taken game theory, you know that language, and maybe you know it anyway, but you probably know it really well if you're any one of those. Um, a zero sum game is kind of an arrangement uh, where I only win because you lose. So what I gain is your loss, right? And so in that type of society where I'm gaining and my gain is equal to what you lose, there's zero sum, right? We, we've just rearranged resources. We've rearranged assets rather than creating wealth and creating value. Now, this is a sign um, uh, that this woman is holding and it says one day the poor will have nothing left to eat but the rich and this is a sign this is a picture that was taken during the occupy wall street movement which of course um, really raised uh, uh, awareness to this issue on the heels of the great recession um, and it was the idea that um, we're going to take you know ordinary people are going to take back wall street we're going to kind of deconstruct the hedge fund managers and um, we're going to recalibrate income and get income equality or more income equality. So again, her sign is along the lines of Bernie Sanders' comments, right? We live in a society where if you you continue, the rich continue to get richer, there's literally nothing left, right? That one day they have nothing left to eat but the poor. The presumption in the sign is that we're living in a zero-sum game where the rich are only getting richer again, like the Sanders idea of they're taking the resources in this so there's a less or fewer resources left for everyone else. So the question is, is the United States a zero sum economy? And of course, this is a little bit beyond the scope of what I wanna talk about tonight, but I really encourage you to look at the Economic Freedom of the World Report and the Economic Freedom of the World Index, which are uh, empirical measures of how free uh, the market economy is in a variety of different countries. And this data has been collected. These indices have been put together since the 70s. And so the United States scores fairly well in, in, uh, in we're in the top 10, in fact, in terms of how free of an economy do we have. Um, and so a free economy is one where I don't get to take from you, but rather I have to engage and exchange with you. And so, you know, I think before we really um, start to make policy around these types of issues, which I'm trying to make the case that they're complex and vast, we have to start with economic principles. So we got to go back to Econ 101 and really try to understand what are the realities of the world? What are the constraints that economics imposes upon us? And then what, what can policy do about it, right? So keep in mind, if policy could just if we could just create a policy that says there will be no more poverty, that would be great, right? Because it would be like magical. We would just erase poverty. Uh, we can't do that. If we could do that, we already would have done that. And that would be wonderful, right? One, one less gigantic thing to worry about. But obviously poverty is not about just policy alone. It's about the, the underlying institutions that people find themselves in and whether those institutions induce, encourage, and incentivize productive exchange through value creation. So that's what we're looking at. And that's why I mentioned the Economic Freedom of the World Report, because I think it really helps us get a handle on what type of society do we live in. Like I said, the United States last year, number six. So um, in terms of you know how well functioning the economy is in terms of, again, do people have opportunities uh, to create wealth, to, to be entrepreneurs? Uh, the evidence is that that they do. That doesn't mean it couldn't be better, of course, right? So what are these economic realities that always plague us? They're always with us, right? This is maybe why economic, uh, economics is called the dismal science. It's because we just start right with the facts and we start right with the constraints. Economics is about capabilities and constraints. So the first is that we live in a world of scarcity. We cannot change that. We cannot wish it away. We cannot use policy to undo that. We just live in a world where we face scarcity. So we have unlimited desires and limited means to satisfy those desires, which means what? We have to choose, right? We have to make trade-offs all the time. Economists always say, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. So scarcity implies competition because if there's a limited amount of resources and we all have unlimited desires, then we're gonna have to compete to satisfy those desires. So innate to human competition, 
could be conflict, right? Because we're also all self-interested. And so you can see how the natural state of the world does not necessarily lead to a world where we're all gonna be peaceful, where we're all gonna be cooperative, where we're gonna be benevolent and altruistic when we need to, but rather human nature, right? Self-interested people who are corruptible, and there are, we're always in competition over these scarce resources. So what do economists understand about that? They understand that prices help us allocate scarce resources in the most productive way possible at any given time. Um, and we also understand that incentives matter for human decision-making. So if we want people to be more benevolent or to be more charitable or to be more entrepreneurial or to be more industrious, they have to face the appropriate incentives, right? And so in a market economy, what do entrepreneurs seek? They seek to maximize profits and they seek to minimize their losses. Now, you could, see, you could easily see where Bernie Sanders starts to feel very uncomfortable with that because you might say, well, if people are self-interested, corruptible, and we're all greedy sometimes, then the quest for profit is going to bake in that greed, right? And that is part of his argument. It's gonna, it bakes in the greed and it means that we just pound our way to the top until we get there. So again, I think his inclinations about human nature are right. But I think where I would disagree with him is that it depends on the institutional arrangement that people find themselves in. The third point here is that everybody has gifts and talents. Everybody has this potential to be creative. And so when we can figure out how to live in a society where we specialize, we can create wealth. Right? So that's what we want to do. Our goals are big. Human flourishing means we want to live in a productive economy where wealth is growing, human agency right, is free from undue constraints, and that we all have kind of a chance, right? a chance, a shot. Um, as Deirdre McCloskey says, we can give it a go. right? We can take our ideas and test them out in the marketplace. And that consumers ultimately determine who the billionaires are going to be, right? because the billionaires have to serve the consumers. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the basics that the setup and of course I could spend a whole semester talking about those, those constraints, but they, we cannot wish them away. We cannot wish away scarcity. We cannot change human nature with policy. Of course, we can try to incentivize human pe beings to do different things. Um, I already mentioned this kind of Occupy Wall Street movement, which really, I think, reignited the policy conversation about income inequality and what we should do in that. Of course, Piketty comes in with his book, and Piketty's argument is that to solve these problems, we're going to have um, a 75% tax on the wealthy. And of course, you know, there are more than one person that is arguing for that, so he's not the only one, but it's an extreme policy measure. Again, the question as economists that I have is, is it going to work, right? That's what economists want to figure out. Um, is that going to get us less income inequality, but also a flourishing society? Um, so here's how we measure income inequality. I'm going to give it a very brief uh, 30 seconds, and then I'm going to ask you to vote, but just kind of vote in your head. You don't have to raise your hand or anything. Um, so the way we measure income inequality as economists is something called the Gini coefficient or the Gini score. And what we do is we measure on a scale from zero to one. Um, a Gini score of one is a world with perfect income inequality. It literally means that one person or, or household has all the income, everybody else has none. And then a Gini score of zero is perfect income equality. And it would mean that everybody has the same income. Okay, so that's just the basics of how we measure and what the Gini is. So based on what I've told you, one is perfect income inequality, zero is perfect equality. Here you have two countries. This is a hypothetical example, country A, has a Gini score of 0.278. Country B has a Gini score of 0.457. So, you know, does the Gini coefficient based on a 30 second introduction, so this is like a little bit of a tease because I'm gonna, I'm gonna unpack more of this, but does it tell you where you'd wanna live? Do you know with surety, I wanna live in country A because it has less income inequality? And I'm not sure that, um, the Gini coefficient alone gives us all the information that we want. But I'm going to come back to that in a second because those were real Gini scores and I want to show you what they were. But I want to unpack a little bit of the factors that influence 
the Gini score that any country is going to face. So um, the first, let me kind of back up here with my slides. The first is just households. So really the 20th century was, in, in, again, I'm focusing on the American economy, really astounding in many ways. Households changed dramatically over the 20th century in America. So the first thing that happened is that more people were able to go to work through civil rights reform and affirmative action. So that's one thing. But the other thing is that you know women entered the workforce in large numbers starting in the 70s. And so in 1950, if you had two people that graduated from college uh, that got married, you would have a, a household where you would have one income earner because the woman would typically graduate from college and then not work. If you fast forward 30 years from that and you had two people who got married in college at that same university, uh, those two people now are much more likely to both work than they were, of course, in 1950. And so that is going to change income metrics per household. Because remember, though, well, I shouldn't say remember, I don't think I've mentioned this yet, but the way we measure the Gini score is by looking at tax returns. So again, it's gonna depend on whether you're filing jointly or separately, but certainly going from a household where you have one earner to a household where you have two earners is going to right, shift us into the wealthier um, income distributions. And of course, to the extent that that happens across income quintile, that matters. But there's another social phenomenon that happens in the United States in the 20th century, which is divorce increases. So divorce really affects income inequality metrics, typically in a very negative way. Because prior to a divorce, you would have a household, let's say, you know, they had an income of $200,000 and the husband made the, you know, the uh, income and um, the wife didn't work. If that was the situation, that's, of course, not always the situation. But if it was, now you have two separate income households uh, filing separate tax returns and one has a huge income and the other has a near zero income. So divorce really can skew income inequality um, in really bad directions. And as it turns out, the divorce rates are higher among the lower income quintiles than they are at the higher income quintiles. And so this disproportionately drives inequality in, the, in uh, a bad direction, meaning divorce tends to skew the Gini uh, towards a, a less equal society. There's another thing that happens and it's just the way people hold their income. So without going into a huge amount of detail, there were some major tax reform laws that were passed under Ronald Reagan in the early 80s. And these really transformed how people held their income, particularly at the upper end of the income distribution. So basically, it became much more attractive to hold your income in your personal accounts or something like that, rather than holding it as um, in, uh, uh, in a corporate way. And so what this did is overnight, it transformed not, not the amount of wealth in society, but the way wealth was being reported on tax returns, right? So it looked like people at the top of the income distribution became really, really wealthy overnight. And so this causes a lot of concern for people who are looking at income inequality because they say, what happened in the 80s? And as you may know this, um, but you're a lot younger than me, I was raised in the 80s and the 80s were considered to be the decade of greed, right? And so this kind of fuels that argument that in the 80s, um, just wealth accumulated at the top, um, rather than looking at the whole picture of how just how tax laws can change how you hold your money. I think there's another issue here, which is immigration. This is not a talk on immigration, but I think it would be fascinating to do kind of a deeper dive into immigration on a different day. But you know, Generally, economists are very much in favor of immigration, and it's because we like the we think trade is a good idea. The same reason that economists like goods goods to cross borders, we like labor to cross borders. So one way to think about immigration is labor crossing a border. And the reason that people tend to immigrate from one place to another is because the opportunities are much better in the place they immigrate to. And so if you have, a, if you're a country that has a large number of immigrants who come in, and of course the United States is a very mixed bag. We have immigrants who have PhDs, uh, but we also have a lot of immigrants who are low skilled and have lower levels of education. And so if you have a flow of immigrants over time that are coming in and they have low skills, low levels of education, 
Um, like I said, economists generally view that as a very productive thing, but it tends to skew the Gini coefficient in the less equal direction because again, you're adding a whole bunch of people to your population and they're coming in at the bottom of the income distribution. But I want you to keep this in mind. An immigrant who comes from Haiti to the United States, so they're in Haiti on Monday and they're in the United States, say, you know, in Miami on Friday, just by transforming their location, they get something that we call a place premium, which is a factor of 10. So imagine uh, moving from one place to another place and having your wage increase or your income increase by a factor of 10. That's enormous, right? So that's why immigration to a country like the United States is such a productive decision for people to make, because even without transforming their skills, they make a, what we call a place premium. So they make a lot more money. So again, there's an argument about the economics of immigration, but it, it can tend to uh, skew your Gini coefficient to make it look like you have a less equal society. Again, you do based on the numbers, but is that a good thing? Well, the people who are immigrating would say it's a really good thing, right? Um, so all of these things that we look at, you know, property rights protection, um, do people, are they, is it easy to open a business? Is it easy to maintain a business? What does entrepreneurship look like in a society? Um, what are the levels of regulation uh, in a society over businesses, both small and large? This is something that we track in the economic freedom data, but I think what the genie doesn't tell you is all of the stuff that I just mentioned, right? How are people filing their taxes? What does the tax code look like? What is the status and flow of immigrants over time? What do um, social demographics look like? Who's working? Who's not working? Again, the 20th century was phenomenal for women and minorities to finally be able to do what we believe they always had the right to do, but what the law and culture disallowed them to do. And so these things are, you know, you're not going to get that by just looking at the zero to one. These are things that you have to unpack. Um, so let's go back to my example. Where would you like to live? Uh, and these are real numbers. So Afghanistan has a Gini coefficient, a Gini score of 0.278. And 0.457 is the score of the United States. And so I very intentionally picked those numbers. You could do a lot of these case, you know, kind of comparative studies. But I mean, nobody's going to move to Afghanistan tomorrow because they have a better Gini. And my point is that the Gini doesn't tell us the most important information that we need to know about whether income inequality in a given society is a sign of a productive market economy where you can have an idea, put that idea out there and become a billionaire. Somebody like um, Mark Zuckerberg did that, right? Uh, Jeff Bezos, they had big ideas. Those ideas were liked by a lot of people and that made them very, very wealthy. But people had to show up to buy their products and their services for them to get that level of wealth, right? That's very different than life in Afghanistan which is a classist society, a tribalist society. So the family and the tribe and the religious domination that you're born into dictates your whole life um, and how far you're able to go in terms of mobility. And so I, again, my point is that, you know, it's not that I think we should necessarily toss the genie out and never use it again, but I think of the most important things we need to know about how a society is doing in terms of, um, whether people are able to earn an income and whether their opportunities are growing or shrinking is not captured in the genie. So we need more. I would want to use the genie. I would want to look at other things I'm going to talk about in a second, consumption, equality, income mobility. So really at the end of the day, what we want to, the questions I think we want to ask are, how are people really doing? What is it like to live at the bottom of the income distribution in the United States? What is it like to live in the bottom of the income distribution in Afghanistan? Now, those are stark different examples. So in no, in no way do I want anybody to hear me saying, don't worry about poverty in the United States and don't worry about inequality. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that the consumption capabilities of people at the bottom of the income distribution in the United States and in many other wealthy OECD countries far outpace what the wealthiest people can afford in poor societies. And the other thing we want to ask is, okay, say you are at the bottom of the income distribution in the United States, what does it take to get out of there? Because I think that's a question of mobility and those are the things we want to look at. So this is just a, a graph that it, um, Gini over time, um, going back to 1913, you can get numbers before them, but 1913, 
um, is when we really start to get good household income um, data through tax records and things like federal income tax and things like this. So you can see that over 100 years, we've hovered between 0.4 and 0.5. And what I would ask you is, is that good or bad? And I think when I ask that question to most people, they say, I don't know compared to what, and that's the right answer, compared to what, right? So if we were up at a 0.9, you would say, that's bad. We're veering into dangerous territory where the people at the top get to stay at the top and you know the rest of us don't have very much. I think I would make an argument that an income, a Gini score of, of zero is equally bad because how is it possible that everybody would have the same income? Again, I'm just talking about the two extremes, but should the United States, are we, would we be better? In other words, richer, happier, and have more prosperity if we were at a 0.3? Or would we be, we be richer, happier, and more prosperous at a 0.6? And all I'm saying is that just based on looking at the graph, we have no way of knowing that. So what we need to do is dig deeper into the institutions of you know, how are people making their wealth in the United States? So I talked about some of these things before, but I really want to talk about two things that are important um, as it pertains to the genie. I think we have to be really careful when we're saying, well, the genie, and I just did it, right? I said the genie in Afghanistan is this and the genie in the United States is this. But the, the genie coefficient is a statistical number that's based on population size. And so it's also based on demographics. Um, and so we need to be careful when we're doing country to country comparisons, right? Because we want to make sure as often as possible, we're comparing apples to apples. So when academics look at this, they want to make sure that, you know, the genie has subtracted taxes and transfers because of course those, the taxes draw down income from people at the top and transfer it to people at the bottom, right? So if you are looking at the genie that has not accounted for taxes and transfers, then you're necessarily going to get a worse number. And then ultimately, one of the biggest problems is that when we look at the genie, we're not really tracking people, um, unique people over time. And this is why looking at income mobility, I think, is really insightful and helps us to learn a lot, but it's very hard to get data on. So when I look at income mobility, the Treasury Department did a study and they looked at people um, and their incomes from 1996 to 2005. And so you take that um, period of time. And you want to track, okay, this number of people are at the bottom of the income distribution and you, and we divide the income, uh, the country into quintiles, right? So 20% segments. And so we look at the lowest and we look at the top. And what this is, what's great about the study is that it tracks individuals over that period of time, right? Over that nine year period of time. So it would take Ann Bradley and it would track my income, 1996, 97, 98, et cetera. And that is going to give us really important information. How fast does an individual change their income over time? And look at this number. Look at these numbers. If you are in the lowest income quintile, so the bottom 20% of the American population, in nine years, 90% of that group moved up at least one quintile or more. That's good, right? Now, it could be better. We'd like to see it move in two years or five years, right? And we'd like to see it be greater than 90%. So there's absolutely always room for improvement. But look at the top 1%. This is important. Negative income mobility is just as important as positive income mobility, especially if you're worried about billionaires and their ability to influence the political decision-making process. So what we should see is that people at the top don't have a guaranteed position at the top all the time, right? Entrepreneurs, the idea of entrepreneurship and economics is that when you stop serving me, I stop shopping with you, whether it's a good or a service. And so you need to see a society with negative income mobility at the top, because what it means is that when you have a bad idea, you pay a consequence for that, right? When you stop serving your customers in the way that they desire to be served, then you have to figure out a new way to do things. And so the, I think the societies where I'm most worried about the perniciousness of income inequality is where there's you know, not as much negative income mobility at the top as there should be. And this is something I worry about in the United States. Um, I'm gonna skip some of this because I, I wanna leave time for questions, but I wanna say, you know, kind of trying to go through all of that, what do we do about this, right? There's a lot of examples of policies that try to uh, level the playing field, right? Um, so, you know, there's TARP and there's cash for clunkers. These are kind of old ones. There's 
Um, um, if you've been paying attention, Biden is talking about, and he's being advised by Elizabeth Warren, who's been saying this for a long time, that we should um, do student loan forgiveness. So again, these are kind of ideas that try to equal the playing field. And you know, the question is minimum wage, universal basic income, these are all policies that on their face, right, are trying to protect um, consumption of people at the bottom, trying to redirect income so that it's more fair and more equal, trying to give people opportunities in one way or another. And I think the problem with that is that it creates this vicious cycle of um, businesses who try to seek government protection or government assistance or special interest groups of people. So a really important study came out of the University of Chicago. Um, there's a lot of been a lot of news about it, which basically suggests that student loan forgiveness is only going to benefit the wealthy because those are the people who have college educations. So it's actually a regressive policy in the same way that minimum wages. So it benefits the wealthy. The wealthy are the people that have the power to lobby the government for these privileges. And the people at the bottom are essentially going to finance it um, in a variety of, of ways, uh, whether or not through direct taxes, but just through goods and services becoming more expensive and college being more elusive. And so that's the last thing we wanna do is to make college more unobtainable for people at the bottom of the income distribution. So what I worry about most is this vicious cycle of rent seeking and what we call cronyism or specialist, special interest group politics that tries to kind of have their hand on how the income gets redistributed in the society. And you should know, because incentives always matter, that they're always gonna do that in a direction that favors them uh, the most. And so I think I'm gonna stop there. I mean, I could say a lot more, but I really wanna make sure I get to hear from you, hear your questions. Um, and you know, I have if other things come up and I'll share them from the, from the slides, but does that sound okay, Professor Ingram? That sounds great. Um, okay. I will, the, for those of you who want to ask questions, um, the Q and A function is open. I, I'm gonna um, just, I'll, I'll take moderator's prerogative um, while people are uh, typing you get questions, to do that. and I will ask. Um, I'm going to ask a, a question of you. And this is, I, I have. I was looking while you were speaking um, uh, at the uh, the Freedom Index. I have some questions about the actual countries that are ahead and 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 behind the United States. Okay. But um, but I want to ask um, maybe just to begin with a philosophical question. It's it's notable that that this is about income in equality. Right, so it's about not equality. Equality being the thing that is um, that is sought, and there's a you focused on on income inequality, and there's a there's a line from from Tocqueville, um, and he he says, uh, the more I advance in the study of American society, the more I perceive that this equality of condition is the fundamental fact from which all others are to be derived, and the central point in which all my observations constantly terminate. He has this argument, um, as you know, right, in, in uh, democracy in America, that what Americans want is an equality of condition. And so I, I suppose my question to you is, do you think Tocqueville's right? And is, um, when people are concerned about income inequality, are they concerned about an inequality of condition as expressed through an inequality of income. In other words, is inequality of income the thing or is it really just this inequality of condition that's a feature of democratic government? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Of course, I love a Tocqueville question. Um, so, you know, as far as what do people, you know, I always worry about saying this is what I think people think because I don't know, but I think it's my view that income inequality is just kind of an easy thing to try to talk about. And so we latch on to income differentials. Um, but I think as, as you mentioned, and of course the ever insightful Tocqueville um, really talked about the institutional environment where we find ourselves, right? So what he's saying there is that what we want is the equality of condition. And I think at the heart of the matter, that's what a lot of people are worried about. You know, I, again, I don't want to speak for other people, but let's just pose this thought experiment. When you go into Amazon headquarters, where's that, Seattle? Um, when Jeff Bezos is in the building, there's a lot of income inequality in that building, right? So he's a billionaire and there's a janitor that works in the building. 
And maybe the janitor makes, I don't know, 65, I have no idea, 75, whatever it is, maybe less. It's very difficult to, to get our brains around whether that's good or bad. And it seems in, uh, um, that there's an injustice there. And so I think the bigger question that people are wrestling with is, well, if you're in the if you're the janitor in that example, do you have an opportunity to not be a janitor forever? And or if you want to be a janitor, can you have a good quality of life on that income? I, I really do think people are worried about opportunities. And so the way I like to think about economic freedom is it's really trying to measure whether we have a, a, a society that has an equal is, is equal in its opportunity. I do not think we have that in the United States. I don't think it's as bad as, as some other countries, but that doesn't really matter, right? Because it's always a relative question for economists. How can we change those institutions so that there is more opportunity? I mean, just, you know, I could talk about your question all day long, but let's just give a very quick example, which is education, right? Education is locally funded by zip code. Um, so K through 12 education is what I'm talking about. And, you know, the problem is that the really good school districts are very well financed. And so they have really good schools and the really poor districts are poorly financed. And so their schools are falling behind. So to me, that's a good example of from the get go, right? You're raising a child, you're setting them up for success in their life and they're behind through no fault of their own. It's not lack of initiative. It's not lack of smarts. It's not lack of drive. It's the institutional environment. So I think that at the end of the day, I mean, my hope is that I don't think people just want to like punish the billionaires. But I think they want to they want to think about how can more people have that, and how can we change the institutions, especially at the early stages of life, um, so that you know everybody has a shot at it. Okay, yeah, it's good. They, they, um, some questions are starting to roll in, and there there's some interesting ones um, and and challenging ones. So um, I just want to I'll, I'll I'll run through them some of them for you. So okay. uh, one question says. Um, how do you situate the legacy of European colonization or American slavery in income inequality? And the person says, um, formerly colonized countries are some of the poorest and lowest income countries in the world, but they weren't always that way or else they wouldn't have been colonized in the first place. So how do you factor wealth and resource extraction from places like India, the entire African continent, for example? So it's the question slavery is, is slavery a foundation of capitalism and how do you how do you when you're dealing with this how do you deal with wealth ex extraction from other parts of the world to european or in this case um america great question i think that was kyle if i'm reading this correctly so thank right. you Kyle. it's a great question it's an important question and i would um I'm going to give you a brief answer, but there's so much more. And I, I put my email on the front slide. So if anybody wants to email me after this, I'm always trying to make myself available for email chats as well. But um, there's a great book called Why Nations Fail. Um, it's by Asa Maglu and Robinson, and they're at MIT. And I think they, they, they are thoughtful. I don't agree with everything they say, but I think it's a really important read. It's a big one. Um, they have a Brookings paper that uh, came out before the book that's a shorter version but they're trying to figure this out. And so they deal head on with slavery, they deal head on with colonization. And what they come up with is this phrase um, in which they say, where colonization has been excessively destructive, it is because it has developed what they call extractive institutions, right? And so it's where you, you know, the colonizing country goes in and kind of plunders, is a plunderer, right? It takes what it wants, it uses people how it sees fit, um, and it does so for its temporary benefit and kind of leaves destruction in its wake. Slavery um, has a very kind of similar MO, right? Which is that you're not giving people their due agency. Um, and so you are kind of exploiting the, the labor, uh, their labor and their creativity. And so, I, I mean, I think it's not hard to see that these are very destructive um, historical episodes. Uh, but I, and I, you know, I don't know that I, we can say that, that capitalism, which, you know, I heard that at the end of the question is, is capitalism kind of, or is a market society predicated on those things? I think in the United States, we have to deal with the fact that it's part of our history 
And this it gets back to the Tocqueville question in the Opportunity Society. It is absolutely morally incumbent upon us to fix those wrongs and to how do we create opportunities that have been so long um, far removed from a group of people because of their race. And that's not an easy thing to solve. And there's a lot of debate about how you do it, right? What do you do? How do you fix it? But I actually think that market economies are one of the best avenues out of this. One, one reason why is they are they move much faster, they're much more nimble than policy. Now that I'm not talking about the law, I'm talking about policy that might redirect resources. The law has to change. But the other thing we know is that the law is always downstream from culture and policy is downstream from culture. So I think that's where you have to start. And these are, you know, kind of it's a it's a tough thing to know how you do that. But I think one way you do it is by just allowing people to engage in exchange allowing market entrepreneurship to flourish wherever it comes from and to support that. And so sometimes that may take active policy measures to support that, right? And so I think that's what the economic freedom, so in the United States, we have an economic freedom of the 50 states. That goes very granularly into all the different states and which ones are outperforming others and why. And so I think your question is just a really important one. Um, I don't think there's easy policy solutions to how we do this, I think those are still being you know, debated. And I think that's an important thing to debate. Um, but I would say that what you do is you revamp the institutions rather from being extractive to what they call inclusive institutions. Um, and I think institution building is a very organic thing. And that's why culture has to be on board with all of this stuff. And so market economies respond very quickly to these demands and to these you know, um, desires of culture. Policy is is a much slower mover. It doesn't mean we don't need it, but it just means it doesn't move um, very quickly. So I I don't think one part of your question here I see also is um, we as economists. I mean, I don't want to speak for all economists, but uh, in in the um, in the vein of Julian Simon economists, um, we believe that people are the solution to the problems of the world. That it's human creativity, and everybody has human creativity, regardless of whether they're in Africa and they live in totally dysfunctional institutions or whether they're in Sweden and they have really productive institutions. But all human beings have creative potential. And what we need to do is free that creative potential for problem solving and entrepreneurship. So I think that the reason that Africa is poor is not because they have the wrong religion or they just can't be free or they just can't have democracy. You hear people say those things in the past and I think some still believe that now. I think those are just flat out empirically wrong. Um, and that's the good news, right? It means that there's hope for all of these places who have been kind of battered in the past, but I think there's hope for this real institutional and thus income reform. Great question. Hey, can, I, can I ask a follow-up on that? Earlier this semester, we had um, uh, Glenn Lowry from Brown and uh, Adana Yusmani from, from Harvard sort of debating racial inequality and why it, why it still um, persists. And one of the things that was clear, I mean, they both sort of agree on is that African Americans, blacks have, have, have wage and income stagnation, um, as, as you know, compared to, to white Americans from the sixties to, um, to now, um, you talked about, uh, sort of policies being downstream culture, et cetera, but if you had some policies that, that would, that would find a way to address this, which I think most people think is a, is is a pretty rotten thing. Um, yep. What what are what are what are policy, um, uh, you know, proposals? You know, Queen yep. Anne would have. Yeah, are you ready for the? It's gonna, there are two radical policy proposals that I have. One, I, I think we need to end the war on drugs, which has been an abysmal failure, and it puts a lot of people in prison, um, which I think, and disproportionately African Americans. So I would end the war on drugs. I think we just need to, in general, decriminalize a lot of things uh, in society. But I think that stems back largely to the war on drugs. So I would, I would reform that. And then I would entirely privatize K through 12 education. So I told you it was gonna be radical. But what I would do is I would say, because when you say that people say, well, that's not gonna solve the problem because people who are in poor communities, which again, are disproportionately Latino and African-American are not gonna have the money to pay for private school. So what I would do, is I would give everybody cash below a certain income. And you know, we'd have to think about what it was, but parents below a certain income, you get cash. 
uh, to send your kids to school. So it's basically subsidizing private education, which is going to inject competition and get rid of these pockets of, you know, Charles Murray talks about super zip codes where, um, you know, you have people that live in the suburbs of cities and they have the best, you know, K through 12 public schools in the world. And then you have people living in the inner cities and what, it, what is the single mom going to do? She, she can't, you know, I mean, there's vouchers and there's some charter schools, but I would re overhaul the whole system. So again, that to me gets back to how do we start at the cradle to give kids opportunities to really, you know, kind of to use the phrase, be the best they can be, you know, because again, it's not their own um, inabilities that are keeping them back. It's the institutions that are holding back. So those are two big things I would change. Okay. So there's a, there's a second question that's um, come in. Um, and it, it, it goes off of your, you know, your observation or the, the, the Bernie Sanders, other 23 kinds of deodorant, 18 pairs of sneakers, et cetera. And the question says, um, you say policy might not be the best method to change behavior. Um, but what, what kind of incentives could, could make a person not want the newest pair of sneakers? In other words, hmm. what can tame human acquisitiveness or does um, does Dr. Bradley think that human acquisitiveness is a good thing? So this is kind of a very Smithian kind of question, right? An Adam Smith type of question, because Adam Smith was, you know, he wrote The Wealth of Nations and he published that in 1776. But before that, he wrote The Theory of Moral Sentiments and he was a moral philosopher. So he's really wrestling with wealth. So part of this question, I think Jameson here has this question. Yeah. You know, how do you make a person not want the newest pair of sneakers? So when Adam Smith was writing, this is just a little anecdote, but it's great. You know, he was worried about the same thing. He said that, and this is, you know, um, hundreds of years ago, he said, you know, people are just going to want a gold plated ear picker, which basically is the, is the antiquated version of a Q-tip. And he said, you know, we're just, the wealth is going to make us just chase after the new things. Like you have to get the newest iPhone and you, you know, so he saw that in this, in, um, in, you know, the 1750s and 60s when he was writing. And that was well before the industrial revolution and the massive amounts of wealth that we find ourselves in today. Ordinary people like all of us were very wealthy, both by modern terms and historical terms. So, you know, I'm not sure, uh, you know, I, I understand the moral philosophical objections to just chasing wealth. And I do think that th that, that is something that each individual has to think about. But some of that is outside the scope of what the economist worries about, right? So I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but I'm probably not the best person to answer all those questions. I mean, I think there's, you know, moral philosophy that would help us answer some of those questions. But I'm not sure I would want a policy that would make people not want the, the newest pair of sneakers, right? I mean, I think that um, to the extent that people get wealthier, they want more stuff. Uh, they also save more. They also make a lot more investments in themselves through education and their, and their children through education and other opportunities. And I think what the economist in me knows is that people don't always make the best choices for themselves, right? We have too many slices of pizza. We buy the new iPhone when we should have the old one for another year. But what is gonna tame that is not bailing out bad decisions. And so I think that's what, we need to have a society where policy is not gonna subsidize bad decision-making. That's the only thing I would worry about in terms of like, what, what can we do? I'm not sure we should do anything other than have a moral consciousness as a population. And again, I think that largely stems from the books people read, the conversations they have at the, I think it's cultural rather than a policy, um, you know, a, a policy that's gonna say, you know, stop wanting so much stuff. Um, because, you know, it is true at the end of the day, you can't take it with you. So the stuff gives us temporary, you know, happiness, but I don't think it, it um, we, could, we can't take it with us. So your point is well taken, but I don't know that I would craft policy to, to try to get people to not want so much stuff. I, rather that I would people make, I would try to make people more responsible for their spending decisions by not, you know, bailing them out. And this applies to firms too, not just people. So Good yeah. So can we get to the firms bit, right? Because yeah. uh, there's a, there's another question um, that uh, from Connor that has to do with um, uh, le elected officials um, legislating really on the behalf of um, of, of lobbyists um, rather than viewing policy as the product, the will of the people enacted through uh, elected officials. So you have um, rent seeking being um, 
you know, uh, a, a problem that you know. And if you look at, I mean, you mentioned Amazon. Um, Amazon is a huge lobbying um, yeah. uh, firm. Google uh, has um, uh, has a huge one. Banks have what? What you, you have you, you in your in your talk? You you have a thing about you know free markets, but this but lobbying surely distorts um, markets. What do you do about lobbying? Maybe that's a way of rephrasing Connor's yeah. question. To me, this is this is where the United States really suffers. Is uh, I think our our economic freedom is in jeopardy, um, and this gets to income mobility, right? Remember, we want. I mean, my claim is that you want some negative income mobility at the top because when you make bad business decisions, we want entrepreneurs to have to pay for those. So the worry that I have is that you know wealth creation is a great thing. It makes us live longer. It gives us more things that we want. It's good, but you know to to your point, we now have trillion dollar companies, some of whom you've mentioned, right? And so the problem is having, how can you divorce um, that those huge entrepreneurial gains that Amazon has gifted to us, right? And Google, how do you divorce the, ben the economic benefits of those from political influence? This is like the $64 million question. We have not figured this out very well because you know, what are Amazon and Google doing? They, they have a very strong presence on Capitol Hill and they do everything in their power to craft legislation and policy that favors them. Um, and so I think this is a real problem. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what we do about it because I think the problem is embedded in, <laughs> it's kind of baked into the players, right? So the very people that you would need to craft legislation around this are the people that benefit from it. Here's what I think would be really exciting is a bipartisan um, coalition. Like I'd like to see Bernie Sanders and AOC along with Justin Amash, all of whom have talked about this corporate welfare as a very negative thing. I would like to see those very unlikely bedfellows come together and really try to drive change. So I actually think divided government, which was what we find ourselves having as we go into 2021, could provide some exciting opportunities. But I think that's the only way you're going to push policy through that's really going to have maybe, and it might only be temporary effects, you know, because he said that money is very powerful. Um, but I, this is the problem, right? It's the problem is divorcing those two things. Yeah, let me let me, let me me try to rephrase um, Connor's question, if I can, Connor, um, and, and, and give you two examples. So after the, you mentioned the Great Recession, no major banker no, went to jail. You know, I mean, these are, that was bailing out that. Do you yeah. think that was a good thing? And do you think that, um, uh, do you think that Google or Facebook um, should be, you know, we, that we should have the days of, of TR, right? That there should be some trust busting um, going on. Do you think that enhances all the good things about market economy that you, um, that you talked about? Are you a yeah. trust buster? This, these are good questions. So, you know, I think that, um, Trust busting is tricky business because it presumes that we know how to break them up into smaller companies that are functional, right? So um, economists understand these things by kind of looking at cost curves and <laughs> these types of things. So, you know, the question is, can, can bureaucrats and antitrust lawyers do that well? Um, I'm not convinced. If you look at antitrust legislation, it has a history of actually the people that agitate for antitrust the most are the people that are going to benefit from the new policies. And so it tends to be the large corporations who are agitating for antitrust protection from um, from outsiders. So again, you know what the economists would say is we want a market with a lot of competition because competition is the best kind of push against that monopolistic type of, of power. Um, that we really worry about. And I think that we that we should worry about, right? So, um, you know, allowing for free entry and exit into markets to me is really important in policy, I think can play can play a role in that. Yeah, I know somebody who hated what he called furious monopolists. That was uh, Adam Smith, somebody you mentioned yes. um, before. Yeah, uh, he actually said, you should we should always be worried about business interests, right? He knew what they were ultimately gonna try to do. So yeah. I think we need to be very cognizant of, of that. So James asked a question. Um, he says both both President Trump and President elect Biden um, advocated different kinds, but but advocated um, a massive state program of infrastructure development. And the question is, um, and and that this would 
both argued um, promote economic growth. Do you see that as contributing to the vicious cycle of government spending and rent seeking, or do you think um, an infrastructure program would be uh, a good thing? Yeah, that's kind of like a kitchen sink term when we say infrastructure. So I always want to know what people mean when they say that. Um, but I'm sympathetic to uh, the idea that it does contribute to the, some of the vicious cycle. I mean, some infrastructure you need, right? You need to have highways. You need to have um, clean water. You need to have uh, fast internet. Um, there's a lot of things that we need to have that uh, markets are not as adept at providing. And so you need some state infrastructure. And again, going back to the economic freedom index, that's what it's measuring. It's not kind of some like, oh, if you have any government, somehow you score badly, but it's, is the government productive? Is it setting up the economy um, by providing the kind of infrastructure to use that word again, that it needs to, to thrive? So here's what I think about this, James. I think people confuse jobs the relationship between jobs and economic growth. And let me talk about what I mean by that. When there's, we all care about jobs, we care about, I mean, you're college students, you wanna get a job, right? You wanna get a good job, you wanna grow in your career, all these things, we all care about jobs. People vote on presidents and senators um, because of job, their quote unquote record on jobs. So this jobs are a big deal politically and they're a big deal in our daily lives. Jobs are a symptom of a thriving economy, not the source. What I mean by that is that a thriving economy is an economy where entrepreneurs are growing and growing and growing and they have opportunities to hire more people, right, to expand their business. And just in general, there's more entrepreneurship, so there are more jobs created. That's the, sim uh, the symptom of a thriving economy, not the source. I think with these infrastructure projects, it's kind of like code for a jobs program. So we're going to spend all this money. We're going to put people to work. And that is very true that they're in the short term, some people will go to work and they will get a paycheck. But what we don't want them to do is create jobs that would not have been created otherwise because they're not generating any value. That's the distinction, right? So what is the legitimate role of government? And when it's engaging in that legitimate role, let's support it. And that, of course, is going to lead to jobs and some job creation. But the biggest source of job opportunities is in the market economy. And so you need the, the basic infrastructure to allow that to operate. But I think the problem is people vote on those things. And they're very attracted to those ideas because it sounds like, okay, we're going to create jobs and we need jobs. And yeah, we need jobs, but we only need jobs that are generating value, right? Not just that are invented. I mean, so famous economics example is I could hire somebody to stand outside and dig holes in my yard and fill the holes back up. And that person, I could give them a paycheck, but they're not doing anything. They're not creating any value, right? So we don't want to do that. We want to find a way in the economy to grow opportunities for entrepreneurship, because that then leads to jobs and that leads to income growth. And that helps us with the income inequality problems. Good question. Yeah. Um, someone, uh, Jared sort of wrote something um, uh, relating to some of the things that we've been talking about. And it's about Citizens United and um, and dark money and the and the question is, um, if if the Supreme Court reverses Citizens United, does that um, does that undermine um, the Amazons and the Googles um, of the world's political power? What's your view on Citizens I mean, United? You know, I don't know. I think that's a that's a tricky one. Um, here's the thing that I you know, my favorite line from the movie Jurassic Park is that life always finds a way. And so I think that life always finds a way, right? And so I think that you're gonna see that continue to happen at, as, as workarounds are made. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a tricky one because I'm not entirely sure we have a settled way to solve the problem. I mean, and there's a lot of things that people throw out there, right? Things that we could do, like you could have term limits and you can, um, Citizens United, you can you can put limits and all these different types of things, but they don't seem to have, I think there's a lot of work around. So I, I don't have a really good answer for how you solve that. I do think that there are smart people trying to figure that out, but I'm not sure at this moment, <laughs> you know, what that kind of once and for all solution that makes it go away. Answer. Yeah, as someone who grew up in the great state of Louisiana, uh, you know, corruption will find a way. We'll um, find a way. So uh, there's a question. It didn't appear on the um, in the Q and A, but it came in by way of the chat. 
Uh, and the question really has to you said so you mentioned Occupy Wall Street, uh, and the and the person was well, what happened to that movement? And the and the the um, dark but plausible seems to me you know I think is or 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 the elites who were targeted in Occupy Wall Street did they say let's focus on something else um, racial issues to prevent pushback against economic inequality right I mean that's the it's a question about where did Occupy Wall Street go um, and why um, do elites on the left not um, why are they not interested um, in this uh, a Wall Street that gave five to one. Um, for uh, for President elect Biden. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think it just these things get rebranded, um, you know, and I think to, for the people engaging in the actual protests, you just not not, you know, camping out and kind of occupying streets, as it were, I think you can't do that forever. Uh, it's very time intensive. And so I think that that some of those movements um, in that example tend to fade away. <clears throat> but I think that the, the issue has, I would not say that the issue has gone away. I think it takes on different forms. Um, and I think that you hear politically people talking about um, pretty aggressive tax reforms, um, tax on, you know, I, I'm not speaking necessarily of Biden, but people on the left talking about pretty substantial um, taxes on the wealthy. Um, I had a, a, my friend, Anthony Davies, who's at Duquesne University, has done some research on this. And he, I don't know if I have the numbers exactly right, but he said something like, if we corralled all the income from the 52 billionaires, I think that's what he said, 52 billionaires in the United States, we would have enough money to run the federal government for eight months. And then he said after that, perhaps it's not a money problem, but it's a spending problem. And I think um, you know, these things just get kind of rebranded in, in certain ways. So I think the focus on inequality to me hasn't gone away, but the way that we, the way that it gets manifested um, certainly has changed. So I think student loan forgiveness um, is a way to talk about income inequality. I think um, UBI, those conversations that are going around is a way to talk about, I mean, you know, Seattle and Vermont have $15 hour per hour minimum wage. So that's another way um, to think about, you know, kind of how these movements have changed and transformed, but by no means do I think they're gone. Um, and, and if I can say one thing, I think this is a really important point. It is a mistake to think that income inequality and poverty are the same thing. And that is my problem is that these conversations get lumped into one. You can have a world where people have unequal incomes, yet you eliminate poverty. In fact, we're living in that world. Now, I think COVID has, is really going to undo some of the progress we've made, uh, but um, we hope that we can regain that, especially in poor countries, speaking of infrastructure and all those types of things, right? So COVID is going to have a ripple effect on the world's poor for some time. I don't know how long um, because, you know, global supply chains have been disrupted, et cetera. So we know all the problems and uh, we need to rebound from that, but um, really amazing amazing transformation um, in terms of being able to eliminate abject poverty. And the World Bank is still optimistic that we will be able to eliminate it. So we're going to have a world where we're under 3% abject poverty, and we call that transitional poverty. So we expect fairly soon that no people will live in permanent subsistence poverty. Now, that doesn't mean there's not work to do and that people, you know, we don't need to provide assistance and charity and all these things. But I, that's a very different question. How do we solve poverty? Then is income inequality a problem that needs a policy response? Those are different questions. And I think sometimes they get lumped into the same category. And the problem with that is that and then we say, well, they're the same thing. Then we all know to hate poverty. So then we should all hate income inequality. And my argument is sometimes we really should hate income inequality. I don't think we want a world where the elites, whether they're in Hollywood or hedge fund managers or whoever they are, being able to manipulate the political system and have more influence than the rest of us. I mean, almost everybody agrees with that, except for the Hollywood elites and the hedge fund managers, right? So to your question earlier about should we bail out these people who make terrible decisions? Absolutely not. We should never bail them out because it totally transforms the incentives they face. It basically says, if you do it again, because you are categorized as too big to fail, we can't let you fail, then we're going to subsidize very bad decisions. 
and you get a free pass, right? I mean, <clears throat> think about how you would behave if your parents raised you that way. <laughs> Not very well, right? So yeah. incentives always matter. So um, yeah, moral hazard. There's a there's a question in um, Daria moved from uh, to U.S. from Western Europe and uh, says, I, I feel much more inequality here in UK, in the US, like homeless people, education, medical health, inequality, even food. I see an internal intention society. What did the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden do differently than the US? And one of the things I did was I pulled up the, the, um, the economic freedom index. Mm -hmm. And there's this kind of band of people who have, the US is ranked 12th. Um, the Netherlands is right behind us. There's this band of, of countries that are, that are yeah, sort of together. But right near us is Sweden, Finland, Germany, Norway. Now I realize that the Scandinavian, you know, countries are not, you know, that what people think, you know, Swedish socialism is, is isn't isn't what it actually is. But nonetheless, I think you can say that, you know, the Scandinavian countries, some of the European countries, have a more robust social safety net than yeah. um, than the United States, and they are by the metric that you've um, suggested right, this freedom index, they're just about where we are, right? Yeah. And, 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 and there's some even ahead of us, you know, like the UK is ahead of us, Ireland, Australia, Switzerland is, is New Zealand's ahead of us. So um, what's wrong with uh, a, a little more robust government social safety net, right? I think is maybe a way of rephrasing Daria's question or putting a finer point on it. Yeah, Daria, great question. And I think you're, you know, um you're right in terms of the tension and you know professor ingram to your to your point uh, i think that life is just about trade-offs uh so the economist answer is that there are no solutions there are only trade-offs and so we could have a bigger social safety net and you know temporarily how much of a hit will we take in economic freedom unclear um, I think if we just did a better job spending tax dollars, we could give a lot more to the poor. Um, very few of the means tested transfers actually go to the poor. I think it's about a third. Two thirds go to middle class and upper middle class and wealthy people. So most of the transfer payments that we take from taxes go to already wealthy people. That should bother everyone in my opinion, right? And so I think that if we could have a bigger government social safety net now, you know, the question then that I would ask you to think about is would it outperform markets? You know, I mean, that's that's all we're doing as economists is what we call comparative institutional analysis. So to, to both of your points, you can have a large social, social safety net and do really well as a society. And those countries, if you believe the happiness literature are the happiest people. So, you know, you kind of get your, to have your cake and eat it too. I think there's some differences. I think one of the primary differences with um, many countries in Western Europe is that they have uh, small populations and fairly homogenous populations. And so when you have that, I think you can generate a political will to vote for a much larger tax payment. So we're not going to get more efficient in our tax spending. We're going to have to tax people more. In the United States, it's a much larger country, but it, that's not even the point as much as it's much um, uh more heterogeneous in terms of the population and so the political will um to pay you know say 55 or 65 percent uh tax rates is just not there yet now maybe that's a cultural issue that will change um so i think i guess my short answer is i think you could have more government provided social safety net i am unconvinced that it would be better uh for the reasons i mentioned before i don't think we're very good at spending money and I think we give it to rich people. And that's like exactly the opposite of what we wanna do. So, you know, my question is what set of institutions would perform better? I would look at charities um, and I would look at market institutions and see what they can do. So for the economists, we're just always asking, you know, of civil society, of market economies and of the state, which set of institutions is gonna do best at this particular thing? And the answer is not always the same, of course, you need all three. So I want to get you out of here on two questions. You've been super patient, but a couple came through and I, you know, asked them. So um, one of them, Kyle says, hey, look, you know, you mentioned divorce and and you have a line um, in broad sympathy with it. You know, politics, economy is downstream from culture. And one of the things you said um, uh, was that uh, divorce is a factor, 
and, and that women in the workplace sort of raised income, but divorce being a factor was was a problem as well. And so one of the the question um, Kyle asks is, should we just revert to the family structure of the 1950s? Right? Okay. Is there um, what do you? I, I assume a working Dr. Bradley um, <laughs> might not might not think that, but more generally, what do you? Does this does capitalism, does free market economies, does this erode institutions like the family? Um, maybe another way of asking Kyle's question. And what do you do well, about this that? Is, this is a great question. And if, if you let me talk all night on this, I would. And there's a just fiery debate um, about this. So if you read someone like Patrick Deneen, uh, who's a political scientist at Notre Dame, um, he has written a book called Why Liberalism Failed. Um, and he would argue that we should do some things different that maybe more, you know, kind of resemble the 1950s um, family. I would not, I mean, I'm a female with a PhD in economics, and I can tell you when I started my PhD in 2000, the year 2000, I was one of very few women. And, you know, while we were on this Zoom call, my 11 year old waved at me kind of trying to ask if he could have a snack. So right, it's like no perfect world. So being a working mom isn't always easy. Um, but I would much rather live in the world where I, you know, I have to tell my 11 year old stop asking me for snacks when I'm doing Zoom calls than a world where I don't have the choice. Um, so I think the world of choice is better, uh, but that doesn't mean good choices are always gonna be made, right? And I think divorce is in, <laughs> It's a complicated thing in the sense that you want you want women to be able to, um, and men, but you know, it, historically women weren't able to get out of uh, bad marriages uh, because they didn't have the same property rights as men, and so you want that to change. So divorce, I think, is necessarily going to go up when those things change. Um, so you know, I, I'm not very sympathetic with Deneen. Actually, I, I don't think we need to revert to a 1950s family. But I do think we need to allow families to figure out what works for them. And that is a change of this, the, the social norms have to change. And I think they have um, changed a lot. And I, you know, I guess, I guess one other thing I would say is there's just no perfect world, right? Where you can have it all. Um, so you're always gonna be making these difficult trade-offs. But I think divorce obviously has some ugly downsides for children and for income and for things like this. So I'm not sure, you know, again, what the solution is to that. Um, yeah, G Gen Xers, the the children of the the first big divorce boom, get get divorced less than their less than their boomer and silent generation parents. So these things go in waves too. Yeah. Um, shameless self promotion. Patrick Neen, first guest ever of the uh, George Washington Forum and recent podcast guest. If one of you wanted to uh, to listen to um, uh, nice. Deneen, um advocate for the fifties family, uh, we'll, we'll get you out of here on uh, get you out of here on. Uh, on, on this. Um, Jared talks about uh, ending wars and redirecting tax dollars to lifting people out of poverty. So this sort of, I, I guess, I just wonder about um, exporting American power abroad, right? So we had a, we had a, um, we had a guest on Monday night, Jacob Grigo, and we were talking about, you know, the sort of American elites um, and both Republicans and Democrats um, commitment to um, forever wars. Um, in the Middle East and the, and the desire not to get, you know, boots off the ground um, there. But those things are really costly. Mm. So I guess, um, you know, you said you went to, you went to grad school in 2000. Um, the next year, America started a war that's still going on 19 years, uh, 19 years later. How do you see war uh, in, um, in this story and uh, in, in, in American military um, spending? And, um, and you know, projection of American force abroad in your story. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, I th well, maybe not obviously, but war is a very expensive thing to do. It's extremely expensive. Uh, you have to factor in human lives lost, human lives taken away from their families, even if they're not lost permanently. I mean, it's just an, an extraordinarily expensive thing. Brown University has something called the cost of war, where they, I, my, my uh, other research is in terrorism. And so I think, I think about these issues and uh, their projections are that I think it's about 6.5 or $7 trillion have been spent in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And they estimate about 250,000 people dead. That's, that's expensive. I mean, um, 
does is it transforming Afghanistan or Iraq? No. We've been in Afghanistan for a really long time. And here's the thing, I mean, again, I could talk about this all night too. You guys are asking really good questions, but you know, Milton Friedman and F.A. Hayek talked about this relationship between economic freedom and political freedom. And what they say, we call it the Hayek-Friedman hypothesis, is that it is impossible to have sustainable political freedom, i.e. democracy, without first having economic freedom. So kind of what we're doing in Afghanistan is, is backwards. You can't construct a democracy among people who've always feared their government because the government has been the biggest plunderer on the block and then you know ask it to trust its government. It doesn't work that way. And then say, we'll worry about markets later. It just doesn't work that way. And so I think the problem is that politically, this is a very hard decision to make. Um, and there's a lot of stakeholders now. So I did a little bit of research on the top five government contractors and the top five contra contracts. So it's uh, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, Raytheon, those guys. By the way, I live in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. They all have giant campuses kind of near my house where I live. That's They all sit up close to D.C. so they can lobby. And they're combined, the top five combined um, military industrial contracts, 90 billion. I mean, that's bigger than some countries. And so they're going to fight tooth and nail to not lose billions of dollars a year, regardless of whether the war is even efficient. So I think this is an impoverishing thing, especially for the people who live in Afghanistan. We don't, you know, most Americans, we go to bed at night and it's like, all right, I wish they would stop it, but it's not hurting me. Um, but it hurts a lot of people, both our soldiers and pe human beings on the other side of this. So to me, I think in terms of a global perspective of poverty and inequality, this is not helping. And, and to kind of address your question, I'm not sure we should have the, the, the enormous in international footprint that we do. And the reason I say that is because some things can't be changed by us, right? We're good at markets. We're good at economic freedom. We're pretty good at democracy. That doesn't mean we can teach it to other people. And I think that's the mentality behind all of these things is that we're good at it. So we'll just show them what to do. No, these are organic things. They're emergent. And it's, again, it's the culture. The culture has to change first. Now, I think there's real things we can do, like trade with them more, um, you know, like subsidize really interesting entrepreneurial ideas, subsidize education opportunities, subsidize microfinance. And some of that's being done. But anyway, um, it's an important question. And I think it really touches on global inequality and poverty. Yeah, you'll be surprised to know I looked at your uh, the, the, the economic freedom index. Um, Iraq and Afghanistan rank low. Uh, in those um, in those uh, things. Also, yeah. to go to your point about trade-offs, I mean, again, as you know, Ohio University is located in a rural part of, um, of it's located in Appalachia, grew up in Louisiana. The American military is um, a, a real way out uh, up the social mobility ladder for lots of for lots of people from um, from from sort of poor backgrounds, right? It's 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 long been a thing. So it's just kind of as you pointed, they're trade-offs and all of these things. Well, this um, this conversation could go on a lot longer. Um, you have been really um, patient um, in answering questions. My pleasure. Uh, and really, really appreciate you uh, coming in um, uh, tonight for this. This is the last of the uh, George Washington Forum events for the uh, fall semester. Our next one will be um, January 25th when Xena hits from uh, from St. John's College uh, will be uh, will be our guest. Uh, until then, I hope you have a good Christmas. Thanks, Anne, uh, for coming in tonight. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody. Have a okay. great break. Y'all have a good night. Thank you.